Good evening, folks. Thank you very much for joining us tonight on the Game of Two Halves podcast. It's my absolute pleasure to be with you here tonight. My name is Tonchi Prusak, and uh, I know we often say we've got a big show lined up, and it is a cliche sometimes overused just to generate a little bit of excitement. But tonight there are no cliches. Tonight there are. It's 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 it's, it's it is going to be an absolute massive show. We've got some huge guests lined up. And tonight we'll be talking about one document that potentially could be the most important report provided to a government organisation, um, both in the history of and probably the foreseeable future of the sport. We are talking about the G21 soccer strategy that is um, just come out for public consultation that has been prepared by Football Victoria as well as the uh, five councils that make up the G21 Um, Alliance Group, and uh, we'll be talking to the City of Greater Geelong Councillor Eddie Contell a little bit later on. Uh, He's the one that's pushing it um, with the City of Greater Geelong Council, and he's the one that is calling for every single member of the Geelong Football Fraternity over the next six weeks to uh, have your say. Yes, we criticise it, and sometimes rightly so, um, various forms of, of various government levels uh, we, we criticise the sport, we criticise Football Victoria, but now's that opportunity for you out there, the player, the, the coach, the administrator, the supporter, to have your say about the direction that we want our sport in this region to uh, to go towards. We'll also be speaking to the C, uh, the president or chairperson, I'll get that right, of the Geelong Region Football Committee, Mike McKinstry. He'll give us his take on the G21 document, but also Football Victoria recently announced that it was launching a football, a regional football review. What does that mean for the region? And that is just as important um, a document that Football Victoria is preparing as well. And it's also got an opportunity there for, uh, for you, the stakeholder, to have your say. So it's going to be a crucial, crucial uh, episode tonight. Um, in terms of tackling the strategic development, strategic planning side. And although sometimes that can get boring, we'll also be looking at the on-field action. There's a lot that happened over the weekend. We've also got some rumours circulating around of some very, very talented youngsters that are either in Europe at the moment or about to make their way to Europe and a little bit later on about that. But there's, there's so much going on. And, of course, last night, the Matildas. We'll be talking a bit about that as well later on in the news desk as well. But uh, we're going to take a very, very short break. Well, actually, before we do that, let's have a look at what is happening in the media because there seems to be a lot happening. So we'll have our quick media watch. Uh, Football, thankfully, has been featuring rather prominently in local media circles uh, of late. And if we have a look at the... um, The first one that we've got, the Geelong Times, yes. Uh, The Bell Park Sports Club to shine brighter there on the left-hand side. So there's a great story there, a great piece there about the recent uh, um, official 
um, opening of the floodlights at the Bell Park Sports Club. Uh, various uh, government representatives there, uh, council, state government. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone from the federal government there as well, but uh, they they were the biggest uh, benefactors of the the magnificent floodlights. Also, um, in the, the that was uh, actually today's uh, on the uh, on the website, the Geelong Times website. That article, Councillor Colin, in the most recent edition of the Geelong Times, uh, Councillor Contel talks about kicking goals for grassroots soccer, and that precisely, folks, is what we will be talking about tonight. Last Friday, football made the back page of the Geelong Advertiser, and that has been a long time coming. Not only did we uh, mention about, not only was it mentioned about the FC Leopold duo, the former juniors who um, made it all the way to the senior ranks, the first time that this has happened uh, with the young club, which, by the way, is only five years old. Um, and um, incidentally, last week we had founding or co um, founding co president um, Mitch Viles, who was in this show, and he talked about those very two gents. Pitch battles, grounds for concern amid local soccer boom. And it was all about Eddie Contel uh, presenting the draft soccer strategy, which we'll be talking about later tonight uh, to council. That was last Tuesday night. And also over the weekend, a full page. We had the Matildas. And then also there was an article about the Warriors want to survive on their own merit, a preview of their crucial game that happened last Saturday against fellow strugglers St Albans. Well, we'll find out what happened there. And suffice to say, it wasn't a, it wasn't a happy hunting ground for the Warriors Churchill Reserve. In uh, Monday's edition, yesterday's edition, drawing a blank split points with victory not enough for Geelong Soccer Club. Geelong Soccer Club did extremely well against the league's pace setters, the competition leaders in NPL3. But a draw... Will it be enough or will it not be enough to get them out of the relegation zone? We'll find out all that out all about that later on when we do the weekend roundup. But uh, in the meantime, we're going to take a very, very short jingle break, if you like. And we've got our very, very special guest, our mystery guest coming up in about 10 seconds time. He's ready to go. We're ready to go. It's time for a major, major announcement that has a... Well, a direct impact um, on the short-term future of the Game of Two Halves podcast, which is powered by the Geelong Region Soccer Show. Have I got you excited enough? Well, it should be. This is going to be a major announcement. Folks, we'll be back with the Game of Two Halves and our first guest for tonight's show. Well, we're back to the Game of Two Halves podcast. And um, after uh, it was announced a couple of weeks ago that unfortunately Euro football star had pulled the pin halfway through this season on the major sponsorship of our podcast, we were left in the lurch. But uh, um, a, a major Geelong organisation, a very prominent Geelong organisation has come to the rescue. And it is my absolute pleasure to uh, to to. Um, introduce the CEO of the Gordon, our new major sponsor for the remainder of 2023, Joe Ormino. Joe, welcome to the Game of Two Halves podcast. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Major, major announcement. Really appreciate that. So, And it's our absolute pleasure to, to support this program, which does wonderful things for for our, our community, but all, you know, and more importantly, our sporting community. So thank you for the opportunity. Joe, you've been a CEO of the Gordon. It's an icon of the uh, Geelong community, especially the education sector, but uh, not just the education sector. The Gordon has been heavily involved in so many uh, um, community um, organisations, supporting various community organisations. And we're going to find out a little bit about that. But there's also um, something quite interesting we'll talk about very shortly that will will benefit all the Geelong football clubs, all the Geelong soccer clubs in a major, major way. And uh, we'll, um, well, we've got a little bit of a promo first to play. And when we return, we will continue our, our groundbreak, groundbreaking announcement. Don't go away. Your future is in your hands. There is a whole world waiting for you. 
and your choices determine how you will impact it. At The Gordon, we recognise this. That's why we champion hands-on learning. Get your hands dirty. Grab what's in front of you. Learn by doing. Turn your passion, your ideas, and mould them into your creations. You'll be supported the entire way. You'll grow your skills in small classes, guided by teachers who are industry experts. You'll learn in state-of-the-art facilities or out in a real-world workplace setting. Your hands-on experience will increase your understanding and put you ahead of your university peers. You'll graduate work-ready and you'll graduate sooner, with a huge range of qualifications to choose from and support services to enable your success. Now is the time to continue your learning journey. At The Gordon, your future is in your hands. Welcome back to the Game of Two Halves, and we have undergone a little bit of a transformation here, um, thanks to the Gordon and Joe Ormino. We're talking to uh, the CEO of the Gordon. Joe, um, the Gordon is involved already directly in in in, in, the, in the football capacity in the football community, heavily involved um, su supporting the Carayo Soccer Club, I believe. So, look, we we have sponsored a number of clubs over over the last few years. So um, we we continue to do that, um, continue to support clubs um, as many as we can, and we hope to do that in a different way going forward when we announce what we what we're talking about later on. But um, you know, Karai is my old club. I used to believe it or not, I used to play, and um, you know they're, they're a fantastic club and you know doing great things in in Division One state league. So you know they're they're just um, they just, um, you know, starting to avoid their relegation. As yes. we know, it's had some couple of good wins, so good on them. I'm really, really happy for them. I also, um, I'm a member, or sorry, I'm part of the Barwon Soccer Club. My son plays there, so um, you know, I've got to give them a plug um, as my uh, my son's soccer team. Yes, um, they're doing a brilliant job there um, out, out at a Grovedale Reserve. I actually popped in there on Saturday watching my two nephews play and uh, almost got blown away by the wind. And it reminded me of my playing days, playing at um, Bowen uh, Soccer Club on a Friday night. It was the Masters Comp. Might have been the first year of the Masters Comp. And I've never felt so cold in my life, that cold gale force winds coming in from the bay. But uh, those are the good old days, Joe, when we used to play. Nowadays, I think we just stick <laughs> either behind the microphone or behind the fence. But uh, um, speaking of, um, um, of action, um, a plenty this Sunday. There's going to be lots of action at the Gordon because it's the open day. Tell us a lot more about this. Absolutely. So on Sunday from 11 to 3 o'clock um, at the Geelong City campus, which is at 2 Fenwick Street, just across from Johnson's Park, we have our um, annual open day, which is an opportunity for our students to you know to meet our teachers, you know, take a tour of our campuses and have a you know explore what your career could look like if you studied with the Gordon. So fantastic opportunity to to see what could be, um, meet some people. You might even win um, some prizes. I know we're giving away a laptop, so yep. um, you need to register to attend the day, which you can do. Um, on the Gordon website, so www.thegordon.edu.au, or you can even call us on 1300 296 301. Um, but look, there's lots of activities, lots of giveaways. Um, we'd encourage people to, um, you know, if they're interested in in finding about what career opportunities exist and what the Gordon can support you with, um, please come along. And, um, you know, we, the Gordon not only has the open day, but you know, we've got lots of free free TAFE courses. We've got about 40 free TAFE courses. So you know what? Um, it's better than, than going to uni. It doesn't create a, a debt for you at all. So, you <laughs> yeah. that. so my university colleagues might not, like, might not like that, but hey, you know, it's a little advantage if you do come to, to TAFE. You don't, you know, for many of our courses, there's no debt. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's one, one good thing about it, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, look, over the last few years, particularly post-COVID, um, many, many people have changed um, occupations, professions, um, a lot of people doing things that they never thought they'd do because it gives them flexibility, gives them for whatever sort of reason. And um, and the, the Gordon offers, once upon a time, it was called Gordon Technical College and it was known as the trades, but there's so many different jobs now, particularly in the kind of community 
um, welfare sector and the health sector as well. Tell us some of the different um, um, courses, the varied courses that are available. Absolutely. And look, from a free TAFE perspective, as I mentioned earlier, you can do anything from automotive to building and construction to electrotechnology, horticulture, plumbing, a whole range of things, hairdressing, whatever, whatever might, you know, might create a passion um, in, terms of, in terms of a skill set. You know, we've got it all. So commercial cookery. So if you want to become a chef, you want to become uh, work at, um, at a daycare centre. So early childhood, um, health services, everything you can imagine you can you can get it at the gordon so i'd encourage people to you know jump on our website or come along to to our um our open day and and to, to speak to some of our great teachers and great staff that that work at the gordon yeah fantastic now there is one way that all football clubs in, and all members of the um, local soccer community can directly benefit um by 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 going along to this um, um open day but also enrolling in Gordon courses and tell us a little bit more about that and how how the clubs can benefit absolutely so look from from um, the Gordon's perspective we, we acknowledge that there's a lot of um, a lot of people that work in, in football clubs and uh, you know most of the people that are at the footy clubs are, are volunteers um, and in one way that we'd like to support um, all of the all of the football clubs is we'd like to offer free training for um, RSA so responsible service of alcohol our food handling courses. So if you're if you're one of those volunteers who wants to offer up to support and, and work in the canteen and sell alcohol or sell not that we encourage people to drink, but if there happens to be um, or food, you'll need these quals to to be part of it. So we're offering free training in that space as well as you can imagine with with first aid. You know, soccer is a, yeah. a tough sport, so you know we offer free first aid training for free as well. So I'd encourage the clubs to get in contact with us. Let um, let the club know which, so let the Gordon know which club you're from, and we'd be able to organise um, some participation in that training. So it's one way that we'd like to give back to the community. The volunteers give so much to community organisations like that, so it's one way that we can we can support the community. Well, uh, Mike McKinstry, the chairman of the Geelong Region Football Committee, um, which is a which is an advisory body to Football of Victoria, on behalf of all the clubs. Well, he's coming a little bit later on, so we'll we'll definitely mention that. And I think Mike's in the background; he's probably listening to to this uh, this show now. So uh, this will be an ideal opportunity for the clubs, particularly now as the season is starting to come to an end, um, and there's uh, the uh, volunteers and club officials have got a little bit more time now to start thinking about next year, getting all of those certificates and um, the food handling, the RSA, uh, CPR, first aid training, all of those things, getting them sorted now. Now, um, Joe, you mentioned how you used to play and you're a keen football um, parent now and a fan. A fan. Uh, did you take in the uh, Matildas game last night? Absolutely. I uh, watched them against Canada. What a super result for our world. They were fantastic. You know, Razzo was just super scoring those first two goals. And, you know, you look right across the ground, they all played really well. And to win 4 0 against Canada sets us up at the top of the table um, and hopefully, um, you know, playing against Denmark um, or China and not, not England in that next knockout round. So the girls were fantastic. And what an advert for our game and for, and for you know, if that doesn't inspire you know, other girls to start playing the game and, and our women and people to support soccer. Um, just, I don't know what will. So what a great example. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. And I saw, I saw, um, I was reading an article today, just the impact that it's had, um, you know, immediately the success of the women at the World Cup. Um, and I think seven, eight, maybe even more of the main newspapers around the country um, all featured the Matildas on the front page. We were just speaking earlier how um, so soccer here in Geelong made it on the back page uh, yeah. um, last Friday, which is you know very rare to see. But it, 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 that you can you can certainly think that if they go any further, which I'm sure they will, into the in the tournament, it's going to have a massive, massive flow on effect. What what changes do you see, positive, negative, or or, or status quo? of the, the the performance of the uh, Matildas at the Women's World Cup will have on, on let's say, here, soccer in Geelong? Oh, look, I'm hopeful that it inspires girls to to participate in, in the sport, more girls. So there's already some, um, you know, a number of girls already playing in the game. And yeah, uh, we've got a, a, you know, a number of teams and it'll be great to see the flow and effect. Like, 
like um, when the when the uh, the the men qualified for the first time yes a number of years ago when um, when Aloisi scored that that uh, penalty to get us into into the World Cup I think this can have the same effect and what we really need I think is government to support financially this sport because as I understand I don't believe government puts a lot of money into soccer so I hope that it flows onto that as well so get more participants in the game, especially locally for us as as Geelong people but um, I think you know that pressure of, of community on government you know a sport that's you know has huge numbers in the participation space it should you know hopefully start to encourage more support from from our bureaucrats now, as obviously, as a CEO of the Gordon, a, a, an iconic educational institution here in Geelong, you, you obviously see a lot of changes. You've seen a lot of changes over here, but you continue to see that, and probably none more so the, than the growth of the region. Like the, the people seem to be coming here from from everywhere. Um, our region just seems to be getting bigger and bigger. And we talked about that G twenty one soccer strategy. That's that's going to be a document for the for the next ten years. Um, just Put it in, put, putting it into perspective, how important is it that we get it right and that we really, really push all tiers of government to, to provide that funding that is needed? I mean, how valuable is this document if it's done right? Oh, look, from my perspective, there's nothing more important for, for our game than, you know, getting this strategy right and getting the support of government Um it needs to, we need to push this pretty hard. I think there's, you know, we're seeing the numbers of kids that are playing. But again, if I keep going back to Bowen, um, you yeah. know, we've got 400 kids in our junior program. I mean, that's just massive numbers. And, you know, the, our ground hardly supports the number of, of teams that we have. And I'm sure that's replicated aco across um, across the community. So we have to get this. We all have to get behind it. Yeah. We all have to um, advocate for it when we get the opportunity. And I hope the whole community gets behind it and we really push this because, you know, soccer, you know, there's lots of important things in life, but, um, you know, a, a soccer club is such a big part of our community, brings people together, you know, from a social perspective, it's just it has huge impact on community. So I would, I think it's so important to really help, um, you know, support the game and really put that soccer up in a better store where it should be. Absolutely. Wise words. And thank you very much for those words, um, Joe. Uh, we'll, we'll bring that little slide up about the Open Day as well. Um, so we hope to get you on certainly before the end of the season again, Joe, to uh, to uh, talk more about the Gordon, to talk more about football. But in the meantime, the Open Day this Sunday there at the Geelong City campus from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, explore your study options with the Gordon. And if you register, you can win a laptop as well. So um, all roads lead to the Gordon this Sunday. That is if you're not playing. And if you are playing, pop in before or pop in after. Absolutely. I'm sure you'll be able to jump in. But even if, if you can't, um, the, the Gordon, uh, what's the website there? I just I took it's it It's www. Is it on there? Yeah, www. the gordon.edu.au. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Or come onto our campus anytime, whether it's at um, our city campus in Fenwick Street um, on the corner of La Trobe Terrace here, or out at East east geelong on uh, boundary road as well you, you can come anytime really we've got our customer service teams will help people and walk them through as our career advisors and all of those will help us uh, help anyone who's interested they're great people yep. full of knowledge more knowledge than i have in terms of the courses they'll be fantastic <laughs> support <laughs> excellent mate on that note once again thank you very much to yourself and to the gordon for supporting our podcast the game of two halves powered by the geelong region soccer show and uh, in return, we certainly hope that as many people, we can we can get as many people down to the Open Day this Sunday. Fantastic. Thanks, John. See ya. Good on you. Joe Ormino, the CEO of the Gordon, um, and um, some a major announcement there. And that's right, the Gordon will be the major sponsor of the Game of Two Halves podcast for the remainder of this year. Um, we're very, very excited about that. And we're also very, very grateful to the Gordon for being able to, uh, um, or for helping us to be able to uh, continue this show for the next uh, couple of months. We're going to take a quick break, folks. When we return, it will be it's um it's um time for the uh, the local roundup. There's lots happening, lots of good results, some not so good results as is usually the case. But uh, folks, we will be uh, back very very shortly. Our name is derived from the Greek prefix, macro, large. From the day we were born, 
This has been a promise for the future. We have grown through dedication, sweat, self-denial, faithful to our mission of being on the side of those who put themselves on the line. Through our name, we celebrate the greatness of those who believe there are no obstacles higher than their dreams. The courage to get back up after falling. The obstinacy of believing until the end. These are the values embedded in our logo. The Macron Hero. It's a celebration of sacrifice and tenacity. Up until your personal victory. Until your arms are in the sky. Become your own hero. Welcome back to the Game of Two Halves podcast, powered by the uh, Geelong Region Soccer Show and proudly brought to you now by the Gordon, as we can see right there in the background. It's, um, it is a huge day uh, today in our, making that announcement, but also it's going to be a huge show because very, very shortly we're going to be joined by the uh, councillor, Eddie Contell, City of uh, City of Greater Geelong Councillor, um, and he'll be talking about the very, very important G21 soccer strategy draft report that has been prepared and is now open for public consultation, if you like, for um, public feedback. And we'll also be talking to the um, chairperson, chairman of the Geelong Region Football Committee, Mike McKinstry. He himself was a former CEO of Gen U. And we'll be speaking to him about his take on that document, as well as the Football Victoria's regional uh, regional review, regional football review. Some big, big documents uh, out at the moment for public consultation, and that's where we do need your feedback. But in the meantime, let's turn our attention to what happened over the weekend, and we're starting uh, at the NPL Victoria level. Unfortunately, not good news for the Geelong side. North Geelong Warriors came up against St. Albans Saints. They went down two goals to nil at Churchill Reserve. And they will now have a little bit of a break this week, as will all the men's teams, men's uh, teams that play in the Melbourne competition, bar one. And we'll get to that very shortly. But North Geelong's final two games of the season are both home games and against top three sides. In round 25, Tuesday week, uh, they will be hosting Oakley Cannons at Alco Park, a very, very tough game, that one indeed. And then the week after that, the Saturday after that, it will be um, up against South Melbourne. So third and second in a matter of six days is a tough ask for the North Geelong Warriors. On to NPL 3. Well, as we mentioned, Melbourne victory um, was held to a one-all draw by Geelong, Alex Stojanovski scoring for the Lions. And as a result of that draw, Melbourne Victory actually lost top spot to Caroline Springs' George Cross, which has won the last 13 games. George Cross doing exceptionally well. And uh, former North Geelong Warriors striker Caleb Mikulic was um, fe featured prominently. I think he scored a goal for George Cross on the weekend. Geelong, their, their next game is in um, two weeks' time, Saturday week on August the 12th, when they travel to Shepparton to uh, take on Goulburn Valley Suns, uh, fifth place Goulburn Valley Suns. Look, Geelong's soccer club still could do it, but it's going to be a tough ask. They've got Goulburn Valley Suns in the penultimate round, and that's followed by Bo Morris at Stead Park in the last game of the season. And it could come down to that game, whether or not Geelong is going to be able to escape the relegation zone. On to uh, State League One. Carayo, they've had a really good run of results in recent weeks, but so too have the teams kind of around them. Um, Banyul City in particular. And Keelor Park on the weekend defeated Strathmore. So Strathmore now has dropped below Carayo. Carayo managed one point, so they're now on 19 points. And even though they're fourth last at the moment, they are only one point ahead um, above the drop zone. So it's still very, very um, tight there in State League One with three rounds remaining. In round 20 on August the 12th, Carayo will be hosting at Altona City, the top side. 
Now, the only side that's going to be in action this weekend um, are the Geelong Rangers. They're playing a catch-up game. But before that, let's have a look at what happened over the weekend. They travelled to Albion Rovers where they lost one goal to nil. So they have been improving quite um, quite well over the last few weeks. They too, just like Carayo, are in fourth last position, but they're only one point above um, the relegation zone. But they do have their catch-up game this week against sixth-placed Mill Park. They need a win. It's an important game. Geelong Rangers need a win. They will travel to uh, Partridge Reserve. And as I said, they are the only team in action this weekend in the men's competition. State League Four, Bell Park caused the boil over of the season in State League Four, defeating the uh, runaway lead competition leaders, Laverton, two goals to one. Young scored in the 60th minute and Mage scored in the 84th minute. What a great result that is for Bell Park. And their next game will be against Mooney Valley Knights, who are at the moment sharing second spot or are in third spot by virtue of a um, far uh, inferior goal difference to our own Surf Coast. And Surf Coast just continue to kick goals, literally. On the weekend, they won 5-2 against Truganina. Yashkwe Karnovic scored two goals. Uh, John Pikett scored twice and Christian Mann scored once. Um, Surf Coast in two weeks' time take on bottom side Gisborne at Bangalore Reserve. And Barwon on the weekend had a thumping 5-0 win over Barnstoneworth United at um, Grovedale Reserve. Milton Bailey, three, three goals. It's his third hat-trick of the season. Kilpatrick and Househam also scored. Barwon take on Keylor Wolves at Grovedale Reserve in two weeks' time. Now, it's quite interesting to note in State League 4, the top three um, goal scorers are all from the Geelong side. John Pike, he's leading the, the pack with 28 goals. Milton Bailey, he's second with 21 from Baum. And Yashko Ikanovic, who had a little bit of a spell in the middle of the season, middle part of the season through injury, he's back with the vengeance and he scored 14 goals. So he is doing really, really well in State 4. Uh, finally, in the men's competitions, we turn our attention to State 5. Surfside Waves on the weekend, they were on the wrong side of a 6-0 scoreline against Melton Phoenix. Uh, not very good result, that. But in um, two weeks' time, they'll be travelling away to ETA Buffalo Club. So that is a big, big uh, battle for um, um, to escape the wooden spoon. There is no relegation in State 5, of course. But nonetheless, you don't want to end up in the bottom, on the bottom or near the bottom. So that's an important game there. Larry United, by virtue of a Conor McGrath goal in the seventh minute, took an early lead against Wyndham FC. Unfortunately, they weren't able, able to score any more goals and Wyndham were able to hit the back of the net twice and hence run out 2-1 winners. Uh, Larry United travels to Bar uh, Ballarat in two weeks' time uh, where they will take on Ballarat SC at Tricardo Park. Now, Deacon Ducks, they had the bye this week and they will be travelling to uh, Wyndham Vale North Reserve on Saturday week to take on Wyndham FC. So you can see the, uh, the ladder positions there at the moment. All righty, we're going to take a very, very short break. When we return, it's time then to look at the women's competition in VPLW and also Women's State League One. And they are the only ones that are um, in action this weekend. So at least there is some sort of local football going on this week. And plus, we've also got the Geelong Region Local League. Folks, don't go away. It's the game of two halves, powered by the Geelong Region Soccer Show. We'll be back straight away. Hi, I'm Joe Gergich. And I'm Halima. Here at Harcourt. Hi, I'm Joe Gergich. And I'm Helena Fentella. And welcome to our family here at Harcourt. Oh, <laughs> 
Welcome back to the Game of Two Halves podcast. It's now t- time to turn our attention to the VPL Victorian Premier League Women's Competition on the weekend. Geelong Galaxy had another good win over Ringwood City, and they've really hit a purple patch now uh, towards the end of the season. Uh, goals were scored by Ross Sally. Uh, Liesl Huddup scored her first senior goal, the youngster. Well done to her. And Aya Sano also scored in the 88th minute. She only scored one goal, which is quite unusual. But that takes her season tally to 27 goals from 17 matches. The Japanese import who is just absolutely blitzing the VPL W um, competition. She is she's doing extremely well for Geelong Galaxy. She'll be in action on Sunday when Galaxy travels to Comet Stadium to take on the Casey Comets, who are at the moment um, sitting in third position. On the competition standings, um, that should be a really, really good game, actually. Uh, Geelong really are pumped. G- uh, the Galaxy girls are very pumped to uh, finish the season off in the best possible way. Turning our attention now to uh, Women's State League One, North Geelong missing several key players, including Lara Herich, Captain Olivia Ortiz, and the, the um, very experienced Zoe Tizard. Nonetheless, kept the uh, competition leaders Bandura United to just one goal. Bandura United winning out, running out winners 1-0 over North Geelong. Great uh, um, effort there by the North Geelong women. They maintain their spot in third position on the competition standings. And this week they take on fifth place Clifton Hill at Alco Park. Uh, Lara United, uh, two, two, and Brunswick Zebras, the bottom side, two. Izzy Wilkinson scored both those goals in the 54th and the 76th minute. She's now amassed an amazing tally of 13 goals this season, the Lara Sharpshooter, doing extremely well. This Sunday, Lara United hosts second-placed Keylor Park at Lara Recreation Reserve. That game kicks off at 2 p.m. The North Geelong game kicks off at 3 p.m. Also kicking off at 3 p.m. this weekend, Geelong Rangers taking on Craigieburn City, a must-win game for the Rangers. They really need to win this game. But on the weekend, the Rangers celebrated with a wonderful, wonderful 2-1 win over Caroline Springs' George Cross, a team they're very familiar with because they played Caroline Springs' George Cross last year in Division Three and made the move up to Division One alongside the Georgies girls. But uh, Feex in the 61st minute, 61st minute and Danny Mandich in the 81st minute through a penalty. It's uh, only her second goal this season. She did score an amazing 23 goals last season, and uh, that's probably been one of the reasons why uh, Rangers have been struggling. But hopefully this can now be a turning point, and on Sunday the Rangers can defeat Craigieburn City and jump out of that dreaded relegation zone. That would be absolutely phenomenal if they can do that. Turning our attention now to the local women's competition the Geelong Region Women's Division One, and these teams, uh, these uh, they will be in action again this weekend as well. So um, this week we had the results of the round four games. Deacon Ducks defeated Bow and three one in a battle of the um, uh, top top two. Lara United travelled. Uh, Lara United, sorry, hosted Surf Coast. It was a two 0 win for Surf Coast. The, by the same margin, Surfside Waves defeated Drysdale Soccer Club, and we had Bell Park and Armstrong United draw 1-1. As we can see, Deacon Ducks Black on top with 12 points, followed by Surf Coast and Bell Park and Bowen making up the top four. This weekend in round five action, all the games are on sun, uh, Saturday and all the games are kicking off at 1 o'clock. Armstrong United to, at hosting Surfside Waves. Surf Coast hosting Bell Park, Drysdale at home to Balm, and Lara United at home to the Deacon Ducks. Um, so that is going to be happening this weekend. Turning our attention now, last but not least, the Geelong Regent Men's Division One competition. On Friday night, FC Leopold defeated Bowenheads 3 0, while Surf Coast defeated Geelong Rangers 4 0. And on Sunday, Bell Park defeated Breakwater Eagles at Howard Glover Reserve, the new home of the Eagles, by two goals to one. And in the Battle of the Bowens at Grovedale Reserve on Saturday uh, evening, 
Bowen Blue, six, defeated Bowen White, one. And as we can see, the, res the, the standings there after 13 rounds, Bell Park on top, followed by Surf Coast, Leopold and Bowen Blue making up the top four. Armstrong United just outside the top four, Breakwater Eagles, Bowen White, Geelong Rangers, and Bowen Heads at the foot of the competition standings. This weekend, 7 p.m. at the Bell Park Sports Club. If you're not doing anything, do come down and watch a great local derby. Bell Park taking on Geelong Rangers. About a kilometre, maybe a kilometre and a half, separates these two teams, uh, two clubs as the bird flies. Very, very close indeed. They'll be uh, battling it out for uh, bragging rights, no doubt, on Friday under lights. On Sunday... Barn Blue hosts FC Leopold at Grovedale Reserve. That game's at 3 p.m. Breakwater Eagles hosting Barn White at Howard Glove Reserve. That game's at 3 p.m. And Barn Heads at the unusual time of 4.30 p.m. host Armstrong United at Village Park in Barn Heads. Surf Coast has the bye. And that brings us to the end of the weekend roundup. Next week, obviously, won't be as busy with um, less games being played. But um, this is probably an appropriate time to actually say that we will be taking a break next week for obvious reasons because on the Monday night, we've got the um, Matildas in action with um, with uh, their round of 16 game on Tuesday night. North Geelong Warriors will also be in action um, um, with their NPL game against Oakley Cannons. Lots of football um, happening and including the Australia Cup, which unfortunately won't be having any Geelong teams. But uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of football action happening um, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to take a very, very short break. And when we do return, it is going to be time for um, our very, very first guest, um, Eddie Contel. He is the councillor with the City of Greater Geelong. Stay tuned for that, folks. Don't go away. Your future is in your hands. There is a whole world waiting for you, and your choices determine how you will impact it. At The Gordon, we recognise this. That's why we champion hands-on learning. Get your hands dirty. Grab what's in front of you. Learn by doing. Turn your passion, your ideas, and mould them into your creations. You'll be supported the entire way. You'll grow your skills in small classes, guided by teachers who are industry experts. You'll learn in state-of-the-art facilities or out in a real-world workplace setting. Your hands-on experience will increase your understanding and put you ahead of your university peers. You'll graduate work-ready and you'll graduate sooner, with a huge range of qualifications to choose from and support services to enable your success. Now is the time to continue your learning journey. At the Gordon, your future is in your hands. Welcome back to the Game of Two Halves podcast, powered by the Geelong Region Soccer Show. And it is an absolute pleasure now to, to welcome back to the show someone who has been on the show um, on several occasions and he's always a welcome guest on the Game of Two Halves podcast. It's uh, Councillor Eddie Contel. Eddie, good evening and welcome to the show. Uh, good evening, Tonchi. Thanks for having me. Mate, a huge, huge week of football. And uh, let's talk about the Matildas because that seems to have got everyone on a very, very positive kind of a, a mood um, this week. Um, did you watch the game last night? You're a very, very busy man, but uh, did you manage to get a little bit of time to watch the Matildas? Uh, I was listening to it live stream because um, I had some work functions on last night. So, unfortunately, couldn't get to see it, but certainly was listening to it and following it on social media. So, yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Now, it must um, – I mean, um, you, you've had daughters who have played the sport. You've been heavily involved um, as a football enthusiast, a supporter, um, obviously through your role in the council as well. But you've seen – how much um, uh, the women's side of thing has has grown here in Geelong tremendously over the last, let's say, ten years uh, uh, since the last G twenty one soccer strategy was 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 uh, undertaken about twenty twelve. Um, has it has it 
pleasantly surprised you or has it not surprised you at all the growth of of women's football here in Geelong over the last say 10 years well answers quick answers yes it's it, it's um i guess it surprised me initially but that you could feel you could feel the momentum coming and just the the sport as a whole uh, in Geelong has grown uh, significantly as you as you know Tonti, mm. um since 2000 and um, 12, 2015, there's been a growth of some, you know, 67% in in the growth of the sport and participation. But uh, the growth from um, women's participation in that G21 regions uh, over 100, 114% uh, wow. growth. And, and in fact, it's been that female participation, not only in soccer, but in other sports as well, cricket and football, that has uh, really pushed... Uh, state and local government to invest uh, in facilities uh, to cater um, for for that gender and and that participation. Yeah, let's talk about the G twenty one report now. The last one was done in twenty twelve. Now it's an interesting fact that the city of Greater Geelong actually didn't sign off on this. Um, the other 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 shires, the other councils didn't uh, did around the region. Why why was that the case? And um, how important was that document? um for the last 10 years and what was done right what was done wrong when that document was compiled yeah great question so in 2012 in fact we we didn't we didn't note the report until um the 29th of january 2013. it first came to council on the 11th of september in 2012. i was a fairly new councillor then um but i was working closely with um people like uh, Joe Zillick from North Geelong, uh, Nick Nikolovsky at Geelong Soccer Club, Zolly down at mm-hmm. um, Carayo, Paul Miller at um, Rangers. And the, the concern the local clubs had uh, at the time was the um, intended investment and the importance that the strategy was putting or lack of on sort of the core clubs uh, that, it, you know, were sort of traditional soccer clubs from the 40s and 50s in the north. And there was a lot of focus on the other side of the river. There was a lot of focus on uh, Surf Coast area, uh, Armstrong Creek, and, and not really enough on the clubs in the north, which, you know, should be credited for probably, you know, establishing soccer mm. in the region all those decades ago. And so... I took my guidance from from those those people, um, and I deferred the report in two thousand and twelve and asked for it to be reconsidered. So when it came back in two thousand and thirteen, there wasn't a lot of changes. But what we decided as a council group was that, you know what, the community in our region, the Geelong region, are not totally comfortable with this report. And as such, we're not going to adopt it as such, but we'll note it. We can use it as a guide, but we need to we need to um, you know have a stance here to say, hey, we don't think it's addressed uh, all of the all of the input and the feedback from our community. Yeah. Now, this over the last maybe say five six years, the northern suburbs, when we talk about the football clubs in the northern suburbs, um, have enjoyed. A lot, lot better support, financial support from both um, the state government and the local government in terms of funding. And I dare say there hasn't been a club that hasn't received some some sort of funding. And indeed, the facilities in the north have improved. Now, a lot, no doubt, is is down to yourself, the hard work yourself and other councillors, most notably Kylie Grisbeck, who's now no longer on the council, but but, um, along with um, Councillor Anthony Aiken in the Windermere Ward worked really hard. Was one of the reasons maybe why um, the, a lot of those northern suburban clubs did get a lot of funding was because of the, I guess the almost the, the 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 back in 2013 when the club sort of said, look, we're not happy with this. We 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 really want something better than this. And did that sort of make the council, I don't know, actually stand up and sort of think, oh, okay, hang on a sec, we need to do a little bit better for the soccer community in Geelong. Yes, uh, but I'll be totally transparent yeah. here. Yeah. Um, much of that investment, particularly in the early days, I'm talking, you know, the last, uh, you know, from 2010, mm-hmm. 
let's say 2018, um, a lot of that was just through scrapping and hard work uh, with me and other counsellors. Mm -hmm. But I'd have to say particularly me yep. uh, in that area with working with the presidents of those clubs, which felt that they just hadn't had any representation in the sport of soccer mm -hmm. for decades. And so, uh, and you might recall, uh, you know, in the early days, uh, councillors, we had some funding. That's right, yes, right. yep. 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 And, and people might criticise that, but I can tell you now that if it wasn't for that funding that we used to have as councillors, many of those projects that got off the ground wouldn't have happened. Yep. The other thing that must be uh, definitely acknowledged is the state government's World, Go World Game uh, Program. That also helped a lot. So uh, I'm not taking credit, but I'm just saying that through the work with the presidents, which were very, very, uh, you know, grassroots, they knew what they wanted, um, dragging me in. I, I like soccer, Tonchi. I like all sports. Yep. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, brought up in it like some of you guys. But what I did do and what, what the presidents and the community were very, were very kind in is they educated me. Yes. They educated me in what was important and what the sport of soccer did for the North, not just kicking the ball yep. and playing a sport, yep. but what it did for. So a lot of those projects got over the line because of that work that we did. Now, the, the strategy helps. All, all strategies help. But you've got to have people in your corner too fighting for you. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, Yossip Zilic, who you mentioned, um, he's uh, he's obviously tuning in and he's made a comment and it's worth bringing this comment up on the screen there. Uh, if the football fam family is serious about making change, get onto Council's Your Say link and provide your voice. Be prepared to stand up and not stand by. Oh, I like that comment. You have... Ab and that's a, that's a great... Sorry, if, I don't, if you don't mind me saying that. That is Joe Zilic all over because that... Joe was spearheading this last time. It was Joe that was encouraging me, pushing me, getting me to talk to the other president. So yeah. he's right. It makes a difference. You've got to speak up. Yeah, so how can people do it? So, look, the, 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 the G21 soccer strategy has been um, presented to council. And we even saw a photo there, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up as well. That's already been presented. How can now people have that feedback? Okay, so... Um, yeah, so the council uh, noted the, the draft strategy last Tuesday night at the council meeting. And, and so I guess what I'm doing there with the photo, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to promote that it's out yep. there. So we've now got six weeks, six weeks to provide feedback through the council's um, Have Your Say page. It, it may not quite be there on the page today, but it'll be done by the end of the week. And then there's an opportunity, obviously, familiarise yourself with the report, which I've put on my Facebook uh, as a link, mm -hmm. so you can go in there and read it now, um, and 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 provide your feedback. Uh, tell us what you think about uh, a regional facility. What what do you think we need be do, need to be doing there? I'm I'm all for Armstrong Creek, but I'm also for the north. You know, we've got links to Melbourne Road. We've got an airport. We're, we've got the Spirit Tassie there now. Um, you know, so we're in the ideal location for some sort of a, a regional facility there as well. Um, and, and and provide your knowledge because you are the yeah. experts. We need to take we need to take that advice. And remember, it's not just council; it's um, you know uh, football Victoria that are going to be going to be seeing this feedback. Yeah, absolutely, and that is essential that we do jump on there and we do provide our feedback. And and um, if if we don't do that now and we just stand by, as as Yossip said. Um, well, well, we'll only have ourselves to blame. Look, I, I do want to bring up a couple of um, there's a, there's a couple of um, comments or c c um, uh, feedback that we've seen on um, Facebook. This has been on some of our posts that we've put, and uh, you know there are a few people there, even people that are quite heavily involved in the football side of things. Uh, and uh, Pete Bradley, there. To be fair, it's a very good report, and so is the one in 2013, which promised a regional facility in Armstrong Creek. Will be interesting to compare it to the 2012 and see what has changed. Um, uh, Robert Cash, uh, uh, Pete Bradley there mentions, uh, Robert Cash actually says, just a reprint edition too. Um, and then Joe Pino says, not sure who conducted his study and how long it took, but it would have taken me, you and anyone else involved in community football 10 minutes to come up with same conclusions. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, not exactly the most uh, positive comments, but I guess that's what people are thinking. But um, how, how much of it, 
this is the fear in football um, circles, I guess, is that this report is just nothing than lip service. How can we as a football community ensure that this report is actually – and what's, what's I guess, one example of this become, being so practic, put, put into practical use? Is it maybe with uh, developers? Because we are seeing estates being popped up left, right and center, uh, left, right and center around Geelong. Are developers looking at reports like this when they're looking at what community facilities they're going to build, i.e. AFL grounds, soccer grounds, that kind of stuff? So sort of yes to all that. So first and, first and foremost, the, the fact that those comments are there, that's excellent in my view yeah. because we're talking soccer, yeah. right? We're, we're not talking cricket. We're not talking tennis. Yeah. We're talking soccer, and that's what we need to be talking. Yes. And 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 and, and I think we can criticise where things haven't been achieved. You've got to remember a strategy and, and a master plan, I guess, is never a promise either. What we've got, what it is, is a roadmap to where – where we want this to go as a community, yep. what are the things we want to achieve. It's then a matter of really getting some grunt behind that and trying to get the funding from all levels of government. Council Councils won't do this on our own. I just know. We just don't have the cash to do it yeah. on our own. We're going to need funding from the state, and they've shown in the past that they're willing to do that. Yeah. Um, and a regional facility, you know, is going to be, you know, what, 20-plus uh, million to, to get a, to get a yep. basic facility. We're going to need some, some, real, some real funding there. But where it can help is... It helps you go and advocate for that funding. So if it's in the strategy, when the state government are looking at their commitments to uh, community funding, particularly in the area of sport and rec, they look at what the different councils have got. The fact that we're under the guise of you know five councils and we're saying this is good for the region does provide a pretty strong voice in that. Equally, you touched on it with developers. Yeah, when they're putting their plans forward, when they're trying to tell a story about the development they're wanting to bring, Northwest Growth Zone is a, is a good example. You know, that 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 area is the next area to open up yeah. along. It's bigger than Ballarat. That's 155,000 people are going to be living in that area. It's bigger than Ballarat. They are definitely looking at plans like this and the AFL Barwon strategy and the cricket strategy to say, hey, we're going to bring this, but we're also going to bring this for the community. So, yeah. It really is important. And the comments that are on your Facebook page, they need to go into the submissions. Yes. Don't, don't waste your enthusiasm. Put it into the submissions yep. because that's where it's going to be valuable. Otherwise, it's just us reading. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely so true. Anyway, we're going to take a very short break. When we return, if you don't mind just staying on, we're going to get the uh, chairman of um, the Geelong Region Football Committee, Mike McKinstry, to come on. And he'll also talk a little bit about Football Victoria's regional football review as well which is another interesting document and, and that could have also some rather major ramifications for the region positive i'm sure um for, for the positive growth of football in the region so let's um hang around we've got a very short break and we'll be back with uh, mike mckinstry joining us our name is derived from the greek prefix macro large from the day we were born this has been a promise for the future we have grown through dedication, sweat, self-denial, faithful to our mission of being on the side of those who put themselves on the line. Through our name, we celebrate the greatness of those who believe there are no obstacles higher than their dreams. The courage to get back up after falling. The obstinacy of believing until the end. These are the values embedded in our logo. The Macron Hero. It's a celebration of sacrifice and tenacity. Up until your personal victory. Until your arms are in the sky. Become your own hero. Welcome back to the Game of Two Halves podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce Mike McKinstry, who's also the chairman of the Geelong Region Football Committee. Mike how are you? And welcome to the show. No, oh, good. Thanks, Tonchi. How are you? Hi, Eddie. Hi, hey, Mike. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Yeah. I think we're all basking in the glory of the Matildas at the moment. We're all very excited. How good so, was that, mate? How good was that? And I've, I've, I'm watching on the one hand here, China versus England kickoff. So there you go. So you see me glancing away, you know what's going what's on. The, what's the latest score there? 
We haven't kicked off yet. If I'm reading up to sport, there we go. I'm getting alive. All right, Mike. Mike, <laughs> as 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 you would have seen the intro there, with um with um Eddie, the uh, G21 soccer strategy is um or, or the draft has been um produced, and now it's time for the public consultation. Mate, how how important is this document, and how important is this process to the uh, I guess the future um, development of football in this region? Yeah, look, I, I think it's incredibly important, and uh, and look, I recognise from I'd, I'd sat through all of some of the comments in the chat and so on, and there's there's a frustration. I mean, I know that somebody said it could take ten minutes to write this. I mean, I could have said up front, what's the one thing we need? More facilities. I remember talking to Joseph about that. Uh, him and I were involved to some extent with uh, Joe Plummer and others in the past on this some years ago. Uh, but to me, that's only one element. And I think the important thing is that the last strategy we had was published in 2012. We haven't had one since. So if you're going to go and talk to local government, state government and wherever, and they say, can we just see what you're asking for in terms of support as it relates to your strategy? And you can't say you've got an up-to-date strategy. You're not getting off to a good start. So there's a lot of frustration that says, look, we know what some of the things need to be done. And that's true. But at the end of the day, I think you've got to have a clear strategy that you make available for people to comment, uh, they get the input, as Eddie's outlined. And then once you've got that process in place, hopefully you've then captured all the views, both positive, negative, and quite rightly, some people are going to go, can we go harder, quicker? I'd love to. Um, but I think once we've been through that process, at least people can then go back to saying, well, this is what you said in the strategy. So if you do ask for support, whether that be financial or otherwise, then organisations like local government, state government, and other, other parties for that matter, can see that, yeah, I can see how it relates to the strategy. This is consistent. And frankly, if, if I was if I'd viewing it as an investor, that gives me confidence that the money I'm stumping up here is actually consistent with where this, you know, the, the strategy of the, of the football in the region is. And I think that would give us all confidence that we're gonna we're gonna try and you know invest for the future. So that's I think the in itself though, the strategy is one thing. You know, it's a document. Yeah. And like a lot of organizations, you know, you draw up these strategies, you make the big document and you stick it on the shelf and nothing changes. It's actually the follow-up part to that, it's the action. Um, and that's the phase that we're gonna move into after the consultation phase. And for me, to be frank, that's the most important phase. This is this is incredibly important for getting the foundation. But it's the steps from here that's actually when it starts to get into action. Yeah. Speaking of action, Eddie, are the other clubs, other clubs are better? Are they improving and are they better at dealing with the various levels of government than they were, say, maybe 10 years ago? I think by and large, yes. I think by and large, yes, because of the predecessors that were in the club and 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 the engagement now that happens at that. Um, it's something that we need to keep at the forefront because I do find that clubs go through cycles when they change committee members um it may not be yeah. knowledge and that succession planning may not be there and then all of a sudden they're not engaging at all the levels that they need to so i, I continue to try to remind clubs to keep your councillors close uh keep your your mps close keep telling them and showing them what you want to do because that's extremely helpful as you go you know for instance as myself when i go into budget discussions it's ex extremely important for me to understand what the clubs are wanting to try to achieve and what their aspirations are. Yeah. What do you, what's your take on that, Mike? Because you deal with the clubs yeah, no. on a regular basis and, and you know, you've, you've been the CEO of a, of a quite a high-ranking organisation here. From a business perspective, are the clubs running their affairs a lot more professionally, even though they're all volunteers and they're all amateurs, but are they running it more, you know, um, from a... Um, methodology or method method <laughs> point of view are they running their affairs in a better way these days look i think overall the answer to that is going to be yes um and this might play into the the discussion we're going to have about the regional football review that football victoria are going to do because it varies um and you touched on it earlier there's a lot of um you know really great clubs around uh, geelong that have been very strong for some time and are very well run and they have to be congratulated for everything they've done and that traditionally as eddie said is the clubs in the north uh, and they've done a great job and deserve every credit for what they've done um however some of the other clubs still need a bit of support um so they don't have the track record they maybe don't have as eddie said the depth of people who are involved in the committees for the years um and the fact that they're, they're a smaller club so they have less financial resources as well they get less membership so sometimes, you know, those clubs are maybe still developing their strategy about how they engage with their local MPs, um, whereas others have got that 
down pat and we're very well established. And I think one of the things that I know that a lot of the audience members, some of them might have been on some of these shows before, and I've talked about this idea of trying to, you know, make the tide raise all boats. I don't think what we want to have is a, you know, a Premier League and Division One. I think we want to actually bring up the other clubs to a point yep. where we're playing very competitive football in Geelong. That's what we want. We don't want kids walking out and the really strong clubs thrashing the weaker clubs 10 0. The kids who win in 10 0 are learning, frankly, nothing. And the kids that are getting beat 10 0 are walking away pissed off. Mm. Um, it's not particularly, you know, we're trying to grow participation for young women. We want to not equalise it or dim it down, but we want to encourage those clubs to remain strong. But we also want to have a more competitive league. Um, and that involves not only investment in facilities, but investment in what I've called, you might remember the hardware and the software, to use the IT analogy. Yeah. You can go buy the best IT equipment in the world, but if it's got crap software, you have a great facility and lots of lights, but the standard of football in the field could be rubbish. So what are we going to do in alongside those things that are important for infrastructure, but also investing in things like coaching? And in particular, coaching the coaches, because at the end of the day, those are the people that are often at the touch point for kids, um, and a lot of them are sometimes volunteers that have either been lucky enough to have played themselves or been involved in the game for some time, or others that, are, as you know, you know, from my there's a lot of volunteers in, in, in this sport, as indeed in others. They have, they've did their best, but some of them don't even have a soccer background. And that's not a criticism of them, but they can't give the same standard of advice, perhaps, to younger kids coming in. So what can we do to help those clubs that are in that situation so we actually lift the game? And I think that's really important. This is where the strategy is going to be all-encompassing. It's not all about just facilities. It's about it's about inclusiveness. It's about all the things that we're yeah. all trying to do, driving female participation, um, as well as getting out there and having fun. It's about winning too, but you also want to have, you know, the kids, what we fundamentally want is the community sport to be competitive, but we also want it to be fun. Um, and I think this is... So this is a kind of multifaceted document that we're trying to capture more than the obvious things, which you can rattle off in 10 minutes, which is give us more facilities and lights, and that's yeah. the easy bit. But it's trying to encompass all those other things alongside those other important hardware things, and I think that's what we're what we're trying to pull together here. Yeah, Eddie, just one one last one with you, uh, and then we'll let you go. We, we, you're, you're, thank you so much for, for, for joining us tonight. I know you're a very, very busy person, but um, what's what's been the main uh, priorities that have been established by the G21 draft um, report so far? And that's and part two of that question is, what what ideally would you love to see say over the next five to ten years? What will be the main things that 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 this report will 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 produce, if you like? Well, I mean, first priority would be that, that Geelong Council adopt the report. So okay. I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to get it to a position where the clubs, particularly the clubs in the Geelong region, because that's the area I'm uh, interested in the most, are, are supportive of the strategy. Yep. And we actually adopt it this time. Uh, so that would be first priority. Uh, second is that, of course, that it delivers on its actions in the in the period of time that that's set. And, you know, you the ones that are, are called out upon are, you know, um, are facilities, of course, there's pitches, yeah. there's, there's female participation, there's, there's fair uh, entry and fair play. Um, but I, I still think the big ticket item would be to have either a sub or a, or a regional facility in the Geelong area. That, that, that is a must. I think we've had a couple of lost opportunities uh, with that. Um, and that would be the one that I think we, we need to demand um, our, our city, along with uh, Surf Coast and um, Golden Plains, uh, are three in the top ten uh, growth municipalities in Victoria. Yep. And so, and, and for the fastest growing city on any given day in Australia, uh, we deserve uh, and need to have a regional and sub-regional facility in the Geelong area. Eddie, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. And basically, it's it's out to you, folks. Uh, we want as many people to be um, to have a, have a say and to, to provide some feedback. And it's the uh, your say part of the Geelong City Council website, the official website there. And um, that hopefully before the end of the week, there'll be uh, a, an opportunity there to provide the feedback. Is that right, Eddie? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If anyone wants to reach out to me, you know, I'll always do my best to to come back and I'm always willing to learn as, you, as you're well aware. Good on you. All right. Thank you very much for once again for joining us, Eddie.
Thanks for having me and good to see you, Mike. Thank good to see you. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks for all your support. Thanks to all the listeners too. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Eddie Contell, he, um, he's a very busy man, but he took time out to come on the show tonight. Mike, um, thanks for, for also for, for um, coming on the show tonight. Let's talk about more about the Victorian Regional um, Review, the Football Regional Review. Um, we, we just popped that up there, and that was the press release that was provided there by Football Victoria. Now, Immediately it says they recognise the need for a comprehensive regional football review to ensure our game is played, administered and developed in the most effective and efficient manner possible across the state. Look, it all sounds good. It all sounds fantastic, but I don't know too much about it. And speaking to a lot of people around the traps at the moment, maybe it's still early days, but we don't really know too much about it. Um, in order to conduct this review, Football Victoria has engaged Solutio, an independent organisation to do all that. Uh, do you know much about it and has Football Victoria or this uh, organisation been in touch with uh, yourself or the Geelong clubs? No, not as yet. They haven't been. Um, and it's something that I think Football Victoria, they've obviously had a bit of a review internally. Um, look, I mean, I think we can always, you know, I, and I know that there's a lot of people on the call here. You, you can always throw rocks at Football Victoria or local yeah. government or whatever because they're not good at this and not good at that. And I'm not defending them. Um, however, the only thing I can say is that if an organisation sort of says to themselves, hey, look, can we put in place somebody to review how effective we are engaging with the, the other the associations and also with the clubs? In some ways, that's an admission of the fact that they know things need to improve. Yeah. Everybody knows yeah. that. So, and the first step is, you know, admitting that and recognising it. And, and and that's not to say that they're necessarily did a poor job in all areas, but it's a challenging thing to coordinate, as you know, football across the whole of Victoria. Uh, and our focus is particularly with Geelong, which we're trying to uh, put a voice. So I think the important thing is that we, we will be involved. I've been in contact with them about doing, you know, exactly that. Uh, we will be talking to Solucio. I've personally been highlighted as being the person they want to talk to, but clearly what I want to do is gather all the views of everybody around Geelong and not just not my view of the world, but uh, the Geelong view of the world. So I think that's important. And I think the other part is if you look at the things they're going to look at, it's a bit more widespread than just the kind of traditional review. Um, they're looking at things, as you've, you've got on the screen there, things like governance, you know, the administration and operations, looking at other areas, you know, they're looking at participation, equity, diversity, all those things. Facilities clearly is a huge part of that. Um, and then they've added in some other things, including pathways of players, coaches and referees. So it's a bit more inclusive, their review that they're doing um, than maybe, I don't know whether the last time they've done one, Tom, yeah. so you might know from your background, but um, Not that I can the fact remember. that they've... No, look, I think... What, you know, we I've been helpful. I've been working alongside um, Simon Wrench, who's just been appointed recently to look after this region, working for Football Victoria. And I sense they're trying to take a bit of a step back and look at it more, I guess, more strategically in some ways, because we can all get wrapped up in the day to day of, of what we do. Um, but if they're looking at things like governance and admin and operations, and, and they're now looking at FV, but how can we support clubs, you know, write their strategic plan? Because if you went around all the twenty, all the twenty clubs in Geelong at the moment and said, "Can you show me a strategic plan?" I guarantee you, and I won't put any numbers out there. Not everybody could. Yeah. Um, and it's not as though they don't think it's important. It's just to go, well, geez, I'm busy. I'm, I'm co trying to coordinate everything that's going on in this club. How the hell do I write up this, this document? They might not have resources to do it, um, and they might need help. And I'm think I'm hoping that what we can do with the GRFC hat on is to say to those clubs that need that support. How do we try and engage with FV to say, hey, what can you do to support these clubs, get some of these things in place so that they've got their plan, so that if they're going to their local MP, going back to what we said earlier, they can hold up their plan as a club and say this plan's consistent with the G21 plan. This is all hangs together. And again, hopefully it greases the wheels of investment and support coming from those other bodies if it all starts to align. Now, we're not there yet, but I think the first step in doing that is the strategy. But I think the fact that it's timely that FV are actually doing this review roughly at the same time. Hopefully we can actually, you know, one and one make equal three if they use that terminology. Try and get a bit of headwind behind yeah. it as long as they get on and get it done. Absolutely. And if we look at those different areas under review, one I'm particularly in, um, interested is the competitions and grievance discipline. Um, how much of it actually they will um, look at the competition side of things because everyone seems to always have a criticism of, 
the competitions and the way the competitions is being run. And look, we're never going to get it hundred percent right, but if there's an opportunity and avenue to provide that feedback, so that going down the track as the game grows, as the region grows, um, as the football community grows, because we are at the moment um, uh, recording record numbers of participants. Um, Areas like that will certainly have to be uh, improved and continuously improved, no doubt. So um, I'll be really interested to know um, the feedback process on that. Mike, thank you so much for joining um, us on tonight's show. I'm sure this is, you know, as the um, off-season fast approaches, issues such as this are going to become even more important as we now start to look to the future and uh, the foreseeable future. And look, all in all, I mean, it's quite bright, isn't it? We just talked about record numbers. Clubs are starting to improve their facilities across the board. There are opportunities for players to play at all levels. So it's not all doom and gloom. In fact, it's quite, no, it's quite not positive, at all. isn't it? Not at all. I mean, that's why we've, you know, we've got, as the report shows, we've got about roughly 5,600 participants in Geelong now. Um, and of that, about 1,400 or so, in fact, call it 1,500 for round numbers are female. So we've seen a big growth in the female game, which is fantastic. Um, and, and the game generally is really strong. Um, and that's why it's good that they have got things like competitions and grievances. I mean, as you might know, Tonji, we I chair a, the Geelong Regional Football Committee meeting with all the clubs that do turn up. Yep. And there's another thing, because they don't always turn up. Um, and that's the thing that we want to try and engage people so that we get greater attendance, so that they know that their voice is getting heard properly. Um, but we end up spending a lot of discussion about fixtures and so on. Um, and there's a lot of work still to be done there. But, you know, we help, you know, coordinate with FV this year about how we'd structure, for example, um, the, the female game, about whether we go for one league, two weeks. Yeah. Where we had the debate about, well, well, there's these five or six clubs that are really strong, and, the, and all the clubs will say, well, we don't want to put the lower-level cl- clubs that are still not developing yet up against those five because they get thrashed. So we had all that debate within the clubs themselves, and... I think a lot of people forget that the Geelong Regional Football Committee is literally that. It's a committee. It's not me. Yep. And the committee involves all the clubs. But if all the clubs don't turn up, then they're not going to have a say. Um, but equally, I understand why they don't always turn up because they think, well, what's the values they're adding? And I think we're, I think it is beginning to build. I think if we can get some momentum behind the strategy, behind this review, then it'll just give Geelong a stronger voice. And uh, that's got to be a good thing for the long term. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll look, you mentioned the women's competition and, and the comp. The, um, uh, how it was a 15 team division and then it was finally split up. And if we actually have a look, if we bring the ladder up, okay, Lara United on the bottom, they've, they've lost four games, but you get that generally speaking. But yeah. even the second last place team, Drysdale, they've won a game in their first four matches. And um, it's, it's, it's actually quite a competitive league when you look at it. Um, Strong United, Surfside Waves just outside the top four. There on four points. So um, at the end of the day, like it's actually worked out quite well. Um, all right, in hindsight, you know, we can talk about it and say that was the case, but, you know, everyone was complaining, oh, it's a 15-team league and 15-team league. But the only way we can improve these kind of things is feedback and 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 in and a, and a, and a, and a structured way of providing that feedback. And that's precisely what these two reports, the G21 and the Football Review from Football Victoria, provides doesn't it absolutely and i've got to meet with football victoria tomorrow we're doing some review for example the country championships which is not necessarily directly involved in football victoria but we're also going through uh, participation we're going through um, the fixtures and we're also going to put in place the budget we're going to get more deeply involved in the financial planning and what it looks like within the grfc a lot of that stuff we hadn't necessarily seen or been engaged in for some years. So we're now it's now becoming more transparent. We're getting access to that information. So it's it's moving. You know, we'd all like it to and I get the feedback from some of the people on the call. We want to move quicker. Hey, I'm with you. I would love it to move quicker too. But the bottom line is that it's beginning to happen. Um, we just the next phase is going to be the important part, which is the doing part. By the way, England are up one nil. Yes, England up one nil over China. Thank you, Brenton Ray. And so is Denmark <laughs> over Haiti as well. So Denmark 1-0 as well. So that's going to be very interesting. China looking like, or Denmark, Denmark possibly could be the runner-up in that division. So uh, is that the team that will be playing? Who knows? Mike, thank you very much for joining us. And we certainly look forward to having uh, now 
Thanks to the Gordon who have uh, come on board as the major sponsor. We will not only see out this season, but we'll be here for at least the next two months. So hopefully in the off season, we'll be able to get you on and uh, uh, we'll have a little bit of a, a, a review of the season that was and look ahead to 2024, which should be even bigger than what 2023 was. Absolutely. Great news, by the way. I was really pleased. I saw some of Joe's interview earlier, so he's a good guy and great to see the support. So it's, that's, that's really good news for you. I'm pleased. And a football man to boot. That's, that's awesome. Absolutely. Important. Good on you, Mike. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Joe Gergic. And I'm Helena Fentella. And welcome to our family here at Harcourt. Welcome back to the Game of Two Halves podcast. Um, and we are obviously uh, celebrating the Matildas and what they have achieved. The first time the Matildas have topped their group at a World Cup. So that is a great achievement, incredible achievement, by the way. Uh, I'm finishing on top of the competition standings. They will take on the uh, runner-up in Group D. And that will be happening next Monday at 8 p.m. So that, as a result, we will be taking a one-week break just to catch our breath and to pre prepare for the rest of the season. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks' time. But before that, we're going to we're going to delve into the rumor mill a little bit. There's some uh, so there's some very very talented young footballers around the Geelong region, and um, it seems, according to the little whispers, some of them are heading over to Europe. North Geelong's uh, Luke Zivcic, who had an absolute standout season this year, has been confirmed by some um, sources close to the club. He is overseas, heading overseas for a trial with crack Croatian club Hajduk Split, probably training with one of their junior outfits, uh, maybe even following the footsteps of young Noah Skorko, who was at North Geelong last year and is now part of the uh, Hajduk Split under-19 team last year. He was part of the under-17 team. And there's also a young Geelong soccer player. There's a big question mark there because, um, well, we're still waiting on a few things to be confirmed, but uh, stay um, stay tuned for that. We may have some more details, more information in two weeks' time. Another uh, talented team heading overseas. And there is also talk of a young female footballer possibly in the off-season going off to Europe as well. There's a lot of news, a lot of talent in the Geelong region, and there's a lot of news to cover in the coming weeks and the coming months. And um, thanks to the Gordon, we will be able to provide you with um, some of the um, most interesting news happening around the Geelong football community. But until two weeks from now, we're going to have a little bit of a break. And thank you once again for joining us here on the Game of Two Halves podcast, powered by the Geelong Region Soccer Show. My name is Tonchi Prusak, and it has been an absolute pleasure being with you tonight. Good night. Mm -hmm.